This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. Rogers CEO Tony Staffieri grilled for an hour over his company's failure. We had procedures in place to ensure that 911 and emergency essential services would switch over to an alternate carrier's network for very specific technical reasons. That automatic transfer did not happen. The Rogers outage left 12 million customers without cell or internet service. The number could be even higher in the future. Rogers is trying to merge with its rival, Shaw. They have alternative and they have choice. Wait, wait, so, so, wait, wait, so wait you, you think Canadians have alternative and choice in this marketplace? Very much so. And you're saying that with a straight face? That exchange between Liberal MP Nate Erskine-Smith and Rogers CEO Tony Staffieri was certainly the mic drop moment of the industry committee hearing into the massive Rogers outage. But the day included discussion on everything from the source of the outage to competition concerns to consumer rights. Rogers has provided some answers, but questions remain about what the government and the CRTC are prepared to do to address ongoing concerns in the telecom sector. John Lawford is the Executive Director and General Counsel of PIAC, the Public Interest Advocacy Centre, which has been a leading consumer voice for decades in Canada. PIAC was the first to file a request with the CRTC seeking an inquiry into the outage, and John and I were both participants in the industry committee hearing. He joins me on the podcast to discuss what we learned and what more can be done from a regulatory, legal and policy perspective. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Michael. It's great to be here. Yeah, no, it's great to have you on and uh, have the chance to talk once again. We were on a panel together recently. You know, it's been about a month since the major Roger outage and 10 days since we both appeared on that industry committee panel that investigated the issue. I'd like to dig into the various reactions and some of the potential policy responses. But uh, as we record this now, what do we know about what took place? I'm reading the tea leaves like everyone else, including you, um, because firstly, I'm not a network engineer. And secondly, we don't have full information. But from what I can gather from Roger's public statements, things in the tech press and from the formal um, questions that Roger's has answered to the CRTC, it looks like the gateway router that Roger uses to uh, connect to the Internet and through which a lot of their traffic passes because shh, that's the quiet secret of all these telcos is they pass a lot of traffic uh, through the internet to get to their own to get to their own services. Their gateway access server got jammed up with lots and lots of um, paths out to the internet. I I understand. I'm not a network engineer though that they can generate these paths to various locations inside Rogers Network. Say if you had a VoIP call and it was going to I don't know Vancouver, there would be a particular server for that. And somehow, in doing an update to their core network, um, the equipment started to spawn a whole bunch of paths. And it, it made me think, Michael, you know the scene in Fantasia where Mickey is lazy and he wants to get the broom to carry the water up for him because the, the wizard leaves him with a broom and and, <laughs> and he tells him to get water. And he, he does a spell, which is a bad spell, and the the water is brought up by the broom and dumped in, but the broom keeps doing it and won't stop. And then he gets mad at the broom and chops it into a thousand pieces. And then there's thousands of brooms bringing thousands of buckets of water and the whole place goes underwater. I think that's what happened to Rogers is that they spawned many, many requests to the servers and then the whole thing crashed. Why the entire network would go down and why both wireless and internet would go down, I would like to know more about, but I think roughly that's what happened. Okay. No, that's a pretty fun analogy. Yeah, no, there's certainly been a lot of talk about how Rogers configures their network and uh, they've made some, they've, they've made some commitments to talk about changing that. And some of their competitors I know have taken advantage to try to say, Hey, that's not how our network uh, functions. We offer us a level of reliability or at least uh, decreased risk compared to what you might've just experienced with one of our competitors. But let, let's set, let's set some of the competition issues to, aside for just a sec. We we did appear together on the standing committee 
on science, technology, and industries. One day examination into this. We'll see if they continue. That day consisted of four one-hour panels. Ours was the final one that had several public interest voices, but there was also the minister. There was Rogers and the CRTC. You know, why don't we start with the government's response to this? What are your thoughts broadly about the response and what the minister's done ever since this incident took place? Yeah, the Minister of Industry, uh, Francois-Philippe Champagne, did his best to come and say that he was being tough on the telcos and that he had the situation under control. Um, that's interesting because he has no legal authority to do anything about this. Uh, there's The only lever he can pull is um, spectrum policy because I said, which is his department, still controls whether companies get spectrum and, and the rules of the spectrum auction and this sort of thing. Um, but he has no direct day-to-day -day, um, oversight of telecommunications companies. So it's really just a political arm-twisting exercise. And the deal they were working on, um, I believe, is pretty high level and basic to do some sharing of network resources if there's a complete uh, wipeout normally to, to a natural disaster. But, but really, it's not going to solve the problem. So he came and he said, you know, I'm on this. Trust me, I'm using my political suasion to get them to to fix their systems. But, you know, I, I think it's quite theatrical and perhaps not going to have a lot of real results. Okay. Yeah, no, it's a, he certainly was talking tough. And when when questions were raised about how, how so-called tough he was, you should have been on that call kind of thing. Uh, I was demanding as opposed to asking is the way that uh, he, he sought to put it. He was saying that he was demanding of all the telcos, but of course, in particular, Rogers, uh, what did you make of the Rod, Tony Staffier, the Rogers CEO, and his appearance? Were there any surprises uh, in terms of his comments before the committee? Uh, not really. I, I guess um, I was a bit surprised at how aggressively he defended not being regulated. There were a couple points where people um, brought up questions of whether they should have a, a quality of service guarantee uh, or there should be some rules around compensation. And he reacted negatively and said, you know, competition looks after this and we do our best every day. And, and you know, this could happen to every, anybody, any carrier. Um, but, you know, he, he refused to consider additional regulation in quite aggressive terms. And I thought that was interesting because Rogers lately um, has been very um, unwilling, let's just say, to go along with regulators. And, and at the moment, as you know, they're fighting uh, for control of Shaw and, and, and we'll see how that comes out. Yeah. So the third hour was devoted to the CRTC, the chair, Ian mm. Scott, appearing. As you know, I created afterwards a Staffieri Scott quiz that sought to highlight some of the similarities between the Rogers CEO and the and the CRTC chair. Uh, that's presumably where some of that change took place or could take place. Was there any evidence that the CRTC is seized with this in a way that we're likely to see some change? I don't think so. I mean, uh, here at PIAC, we're pretty critical of the present management of the CRTC and indeed the performance of the, the regulator for the last five years. I was really uninspired by um, by Ian Scott's answers. I, I, I thought it showed less of a, you know, I thought your, your quiz was funny and I took it and got 75%, by the way. Um, but I, uh, I thought that he was less agreeing with what Staffieri said is, more as that he was saying, I have no imagination. We don't know how to handle this. Um, you know, sort of throw, like you said, he shrugged his shoulders. He, he did it, sort of physically do that when he was asked, like, what can be done about this? And that's just not good enough. You know, CRTC under the Telecommunications Act has powers that would make any other regulator blush. They have so much power to do things. Um, you know, we, we called for an immediate inquiry into the Rogers outage. The CRTC can appoint an inquiry officer. They have the power of a superior court to enter premises and to seize documents and all sorts of things. Uh, they could have done instantly that. The chair could have uh, gone on TV or other uh, modes of communication to try to reassure Canadians that they were doing something and maybe they wouldn't have the specifics yet. But it felt much more like he was kind of dragged kicking and screaming into this hearing and then uh, and then gave, you know, pretty much a hand wavy kind of, yeah, we're kind of looking after it. Not much we can do. Don't worry about it. And that's just really not good enough. They have they have many, many legal tools and just the lack of leadership and the 
sort of complacency. I, I, I found that disturbing. Yeah, no, I, well, you're certainly not alone in that regard. You know, you just mentioned that uh, you were the first to call on the CRTC to conduct an inquiry into the outage. Is that what we have? You know, there was obviously the the series of questions that were posed to Rogers. They responded. We're now waiting to see what comes next. But is this an inquiry? If it's not, what what is it from a legal process perspective, as far as you can tell? Yeah, I've been trying to dispel the notion that the CRTC has undertaken an inquiry into the Rogers outage. They haven't. What they have is an open proceeding on general network outages, which was created after the hurricane went through Nova Scotia about, I think, 2019 or so, and, you know, snapped a bunch of telephone poles and surprise, the phone network didn't work anymore. Um, and so they have these open proceedings now at CRTC on a couple of files where they'll file documents that are sort of related in, in there, but there's no real formal proceeding going on. I'll give you another example just to to demonstrate the difference between that and, and what we asked for. SIM swap fraud, uh, which I think, you know, you've, you've maybe spoken about and certainly we have tried to tell people about, is another open one where the companies are supposedly working on getting rid of fraud where someone swaps out your SIM card and steals all your connected bank accounts and, and, and anything connected to your phone. And that's an open, that's an open file where they, they just ask the companies questions about what are you doing about SIM swap and dump documents in there. But there's no real formal process where the public can come and ask questions or groups like ours. This is the same thing. So um, there's an open proceeding on outages and they've just asked Rogers in relation to this particular outage, could you answer these questions? And, and we do have some redacted answers from Rogers, but it was so unclear to us that anything was really formally going on in terms of a public inquiry that we had to write a letter from PIAC here to say, is this, is this a public document in the sense that we can ask for more disclosure from Rogers in the public interest or is, what is this thing? And so CRTC has fallen into this trap now of doing this with a number of contentious or controversial proceedings where they're kind of, I feel like they're kind of hiding it uh, under the skirts of the regulatory system instead of having open public processes, which is what we expect from you know a, a public regulator. Have you got an answer yet to that question of what is this? Can we, can you challenge what Rogers provided? There was, there was a remarkable amount, perhaps not remarkable given that redactions aren't uncommon at the CRTC, but for someone new to this, to see some of the stuff that Rogers was asking to have redacted that in a public emergency type situation like this, or the one in which so many were people were affected. I think many might be surprised to see what Rogers felt the public shouldn't get to know. Uh, yes, we got clarification from the CRTC that this was like a disclosure request in a regular proceeding and we could challenge the confidentiality. Now, uh, I saw that letter last Friday and uh, it only got posted on the public website this Monday, so people are probably scrambling, but it's due tomorrow. Uh, I won't tell you exactly what we're asking for, but we're making those types of arguments that most of this should be public. The general default rule is the public should see what's happening at the regulator. Companies shouldn't expect confidentiality. And it's only if it's going to really destroy their business or allow a hacker to to attack the, the company next week kind of thing that you would, would deny having that stuff put on the public record. And I think the public wants to know quite just quite justifiably as many details as they can about this so that they can judge the service and the reaction of Rogers and, you know, put in their two cents worth about how they experienced it. Uh, maybe come up with some great ideas, but, you know, unless we see the details, it'll be hard to know. And, and I'll be stuck with making, you know, silly analogies to Disney movies instead of having a network um, explanation for what happened. And oh, well, so by the time people listen to this, some of those documents uh, may be available online. Mm -hmm. You know, this, the, some of the comments that you that you've just made about the CRTC and the, the, the oddities associated with some of the processes, uh, uh, for listeners of this podcast, we forgiven that they they heard much the same thing just a few weeks ago when Monica Auer came on the podcast to talk a bit about the Radio Canada case and her frustration with the process once again that the CRTC was using. You know, what do you make of, of the situation where you know long long standing veterans with enormous amount of expertise in this area are looking what the CRTC is doing and are having a hard time figuring out how it fits squarely within. The, the, within their regulated space and, and what the Broadcasting Act or the Telecommunications Act provides. It's awkward. Um, I'm not quite sure what the motivation is inside CRTC, but there is this 
um, desire to manage the, if you will, the message on regulatory in telecommunications and broadcasting. The CRTC seems to be trying to use its regulatory power to manage the message instead of like, like a comms firm would uh, rather than a regulator. And, and it's infected process to the point where, yeah, as Monica said, in broadcasting, it's happening all the time. We've had a number of applications that PIAC has filed that um, the commission refused to post, which they don't have the power to do, but they, it was on a controversial topic. One was on the COVID alert app. They refused to post it until we wrote back and, you know, did it again <laughs> and, and said to them, like, where's your authority to, to, to not post this thing. And there've been a couple of other situations where we've considered even having to go to federal court to make them do a regulatory step that I think has to be done, at least the way I read the rules. And, and to me, that's baffling. It's either trying to control the message or protect some sort of interest. And I'm not quite clear on what that is. Um, in my darker days, I almost feel like the present management of the CRTC kind of wants to destroy the regulatory authority of the CRTC in a backhanded way. But I, you know, I don't know if it, I can go that far, but you know, you just get so frustrated, you, you start having fantasies of what's going on because I can't explain it. Yeah, no, I don't think you're alone in that regard. You highlighted a, a few moments ago some of the kinds of powers that it has, talking about how powerful it is as a regulator. Uh, what do you think it should be doing in this circumstance beyond following uh, process, given given what, what took place with Rogers? Yeah, I would like to see, we, we PIAC asked for two things. Firstly, the, the inquiry uh, so that, you know, documents can be looked at before they get destroyed it, or, you know, in the normal course get lost or... Uh, before people's memories fade, before software gets changed, all that sort of thing to get to the bottom while memory is fresh. But apart from the sort of detailed recommendations that might come out of that um, regarding Rogers, we wanted a, a wider public inquiry because other carriers are going to have outages in the future. And the consumers need to know whether they're going to get money back, uh, how much. Uh, they need to have proper communication so they know how long the outage is going to last and whether the company knows or doesn't know what's causing it. They need to, uh, you know, they need to know if their carrier is, is affected because they might be a wholesale, um, they, their carrier might be a wholesale customer of a larger carrier. So that they, they need to know which company is down, whether it's their, their own carrier or, or a bigger one. Um, all sorts of things could be um, brought out and there could be rules made. And I, I was referring to powers you know, if, if the CRTC wants to specify a certain level of network uh, architecture or resiliency, they certainly have the power to do it. They, they can set rules under their interconnection power, uh, the way that, that companies interconnect with others. They can specify how that's done. They even have powers to require companies to, to build or do anything. Uh, they can also put any kind of condition on offering of service. And all of these things you know, I, I feel are left fallow. Um, I can go into why that is and how, why so many CRC powers are not used, but but they do have it if they need it. Okay, why don't we go there for a moment? Why, why do you think they they leave so many tools that are available in their toolkit in the toolkit as opposed to actually being more proactive and, and using the powers they've been given under the legislation. Because of course, what the, the debate often turns to, well, we need legislative reform, but in, implicitly when you say they've got all these different tools, it becomes less about new powers in the act and more about having the regulator actually use the powers they have. Right. Okay. Um, I don't want to confuse people, but in 1993 with our new telecommunications act, when it was changed, uh, a section was put into the Telecommunications Act called Forbearance, Section 34, and it lets the CRTC not regulate if they feel that most of the policy objectives of telecommunications can be um, can be achieved without regulating. In other words, letting the market do it. And they have to, they absolutely have to not regulate in certain areas if competition is going to protect the interests of users. That's the test. And over the years, the CRTC has either, like with home phone service, like regular, you know, phones, black phones kind of thing, uh, has either found that, that competition was strong enough to protect users and therefore has let a lot of these other powers, um, like sideline these other powers, or a service like internet 
or wireless has pretty much never ever been subject to these the powers I spoke of that are so sweeping because right off the get go the CRTC said the market here is very competitive there's lots of providers you'll recall the early days of the internet there were many many little ISPs uh, with wireless uh, there were more startups there that were not necessarily owned by the incumbents where I'm going into the you know misty past but it was true at one point and so they they forbore is the fancy word from uh, these regulations on conditions, on interconnection, on liability, which we haven't got to yet, and on um, interconnection terms of service. So, in effect, the legislation has this section in it that says don't legislate, and that is as long as as long as you're relying on competition. And and the world's been very you know pro competition, neoliberal, if you want to use those words, and the CRT is just kind of sat back in the easy chair and, and let her rip. And, and unfortunately, this outage is kind of the consequence of that. That's a fascinating perspective on how different choices ultimately have real world implications in the way that we just saw with the outage. I want to come back to the competition point in a moment. But before we do that, we mentioned you, you mentioned that there are limited powers that the federal government has, but the, the minister's put his chips primarily on the industry developing policies around emergency roaming and mandatory assistance. What are your thoughts on those policies? You know, is there any, you know, do you, do you see them as being helpful and having an impact? And are there other things, you know, taking note of the limited powers that they have to directly regulate in this space that the government could be doing? Well, as far as it goes, uh, an agreement between the major carriers to pass traffic around to the extent they can during, a, say, a natural disaster is a good thing. Uh, it would give people um, sort of an automatic rollover roaming. Um, you know, so if you were on Rogers and and all of Rogers Towers for whatever reason got knocked down in the storm and Bell still had a few up, uh, you would maybe be able to roam on on uh, Bell's network. Um, and there's some inter, you know cooperation that's demand supposedly demanded under this agreement. Um, it's based on an FCC similar order that came out in June uh, for the Federal Communications Commission in the United States. And uh, as far as it goes, it, it's good, but it's kind of um, I feel like again it's kind of a distraction. It's something the political branch and that department can can do um, can try to negotiate um, as a distraction to the to the deeper to the deeper dig. But I mean, if, if they do come up with that agreement, it would be good as far as it goes. It's just, it's not going to solve a, an outage like Rogers because <clears throat> there's no way Bell or um, Telus could take all of Rogers traffic by flipping a switch. It's impossible because their networks are already 90, 90, 95% full. So they can't take another whole network's worth of traffic, you know, in, in an hour. Okay. So some real limits, which won't cause a surprise in terms of how effective those things might be. One of the areas that, you know, a number of people raised that uh, that someone, whether it's the government or the CRTC, should be should be prioritizing in a way that we haven't seen so far are consumer rights on with respect to what took place. And PX has certainly been, you know, one of the leading consumer voices on telecom issues for many, many years. Do we need better consumer protection rules in this space? Do we need clearer standards around compensation when these kinds of outages occur? You can do it that way. And to some extent, that's what was done with the wireless code um, when people were complaining about long contracts and, and the wireless code made them two years and uh, gave a cap on roaming um, you know, costs when you were uh, outside the country or a, a, a cap on data costs if you did overage uh, in the country. Um, those, those sorts of structures like, like, the, uh, like the wireless code could be done here too. And, and um, out of a proceeding where we say, consider what the baseline rules for, for all the carriers should be, you, you could style it as a, you can style it as a consumer bill of rights or as a set of obligations for the company. It doesn't really matter to me, which either way you do it. I think people understand the concept of bill of rights, the average person more clearly than they would a set of obligations on the companies. It's just that the Telecom Act, as I said, like has all these tools lying around that you just have to pick up. <laughs> and to me, it's more a matter of, do you want to say that um, outages is an area of public safety and therefore we are going to 
make an exception to the we don't generally regulate forbearance rule for this area, I think that's smart. And I, that would be the, I think, easier way to do it. Also, it's easier to set rules across the board for all carriers, right? Rather than waiting for a complaint from a consumer to say my rights to have my network be up 99.999% of the time have been violated. Uh, it, because the act is written that way, all the tools are there. So it's just much more efficient than creating a consumer bill of rights and then having people have to make complaints to CRTC about, you know, what, what would have happened here if we had a consumer bill of rights with a right to be connected? You'd have to have, what, a million, two million people file a complaint? It's, it's, not, it's not the best way to go about it. I, I understand the desire for people to understand their their rights, but I, I think it can be done with a regulator that cares and that communicates to consumers, don't worry, we got your back. And unfortunately, the regulator hasn't been that lately. And I'll just say the, that the government hasn't led or encouraged the CRTC to do that. So, I mean, the minister could be out there saying, I expect my regulator to look after people and I expect to hear back. Uh, soon about how well you're doing on that cabinet under section 14 of the telecom act can require a report from the CRTC on any matter that they can investigate into or that they're working on within I think it's 60 days if they really wanted to lean on CRTC to do something they could have cabinet could have said um, just give us a report in 60 days on how that how that outages thing is coming along which is a indirect way of telling them to do stuff and they haven't done that so I'm also not seeing a lot of political leadership here I'm afraid Thanks, John. So consumer bill of rights or potentially a, a regulator becoming more more aggressive and active using some of the tools that they have. For those consumers that have heard, Rogers made, has made the commitment to provide compensation in the amount of five days worth of service. For those that might feel that that's still not good enough, uh, do they have any options? Is there any prospect of getting something more? A lot of people have contacted us asking if they can get more money than Rogers was offering because it was five days of service and I'll just say that unbidden, I got offered an extra five gigabytes because I have a Rogers phone of data for the next six months as a sweetener for not having left to go to another company. The whole liability for cons you know consumers to understand the whole liability regime is very complicated legally. It's probably not possible to, to get more than Rogers has uh, offered. Even if you have consequential damages, I, I, for the fun of it, looked up my Rogers contract and they disclaim all liability for any use of the service um, and any consequential damages or any damages for just not being able to, to get a dial tone, so to speak. Um, and that seems odd, but that's because of forbearance again. The CRTC has the power to tell the companies how to write their limitations of liability clauses, but hey, that's one of the things that they don't regulate anymore. So now Rogers just their terms of service, at least the ones I have, basically say, you know, whatever we decide to give you in our good graces, that's all you get. So just so people know. Now, some dismissed the competition concerns, at least with respect to the outage. I said, listen, what is it? it doesn't have much to do with competition. Outages will take place from time to time. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there are a lot of consumers that that have found themselves you know, subject or at increased risk, let's say, when it comes to putting all their eggs in a single provider basket, largely because mm -hmm. bundling becomes one of the ways that you try to counter the effects of a lack of competition when you've got high prices. So that's one place where you might be able to find a discount. So there's a trade-off there. Perhaps you get slightly better prices, but we now learn that higher risks, uh, including one uh, kind of impact that you might get from an outage. What are some of your thoughts in terms of the role competition plays here, and we can think about it both from the perspective of the government as well as, of course, the CRTC. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a fascinating problem and a very deadly serious one for consumers. You're quite right. The average consumer um, uses the tools they have at their disposal to limit their bills. And then in this case, if you do take a bundle, all of your services are one provider. Therefore, obviously, they have one point of failure. Um, and if you had two or three, then you could diversify and, you know, use your landline, which might be different from your internet, which might be different from your cell phone. Sure. But many people take the bundle that just demonstrates to me how few, um, consumer control or, or 
methods the market affords consumers to to try to deal with high prices other ways you could handle this would be a increased competition so for example a, a competition regulator that did not approve telecom mergers and that was aggressive in in terms of um uh, any any abuse of the market, any sort of abuse of dominance is the fancy words for it, uh, and and was patrolling to try to have more and more carriers. Uh, you could have uh, policies like mobile virtual network operators to bring more carriers uh, into the wireless space, which is you know pretty much dominated by three three large companies. Um, lots of those things would help, but I also understand that even having, you know, 50 carriers isn't going to solve at the end of the day, or if there were one carrier, it doesn't matter, that there could be an outage. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. If you had 50 people having, um, 50 companies having an outage, um, one having an outage on average per every year or two years, you'd still have 25 outages. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's important to have some baseline rules for when the outage happens. In other words, there's two problems. If you have competition, um, it might improve some of the ability of consumers to avoid companies that are not um, providing good quality. But at the end of the day, some things are necessarily, they have to be regulated because companies won't compete on them. Like this is the thing, I'm not sure that companies are going to compete on their quality of service um, because they traditionally have not they they compete on price and you know features and bundling and and the sexy stuff not we have 99.999 percent uptime and theirs is only 99.99 you know um it, it's not it's it's not something that i think the competition can look after but competition makes it worse when lack of competition excuse me makes it worse when that inevitable wipeout comes if rogers had also had all the shaw customers the outage probably would have been larger <laughs> um and so that as they get bigger any effects that are negative uh it just affects more people so i'm rambling michael i don't i don't think that they necessarily uh are perfect overlap in um, venn diagram circles but uh it's a fascinating problem that we should talk about in detail and i would love to have a proceeding where we we ventilated all this so a lot of space for further further action the specifics around what took place here how the networks are run identifying some of the issues there consumers potentially with the bill of rights potentially with a regulator that uses some of the tools that they've got and then even yep. more broadly uh, the issues around competition that of course have been really kind of many ways the touch tone issue around telecom now for many years John, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Uh, it's been great to be here. Thanks so much for, for all this, Michael. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Law Bites Pod or Michael Geist at M Geist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.